and welcome to the horrible hallowed halls of what happened, a show where we analyze and agonize over the biggest bungles of the video game industry. The biggest bungles of the entertainment industry, that is. A lot of you have suggested it, and a lot of you are getting it, because we're branching out to the realm of cinema. You know, real art, unlike those silly toys for children. And what better place to start than one of the most monstrous Hollywood misfires of the 90s? A movie where pretty much every decision made was the wrong one. It halted the production of planned sequels dead in their tracks. irreparably damaged the careers of two filmmakers and pissed off the Japanese originators of the franchise so much that they took a few swipes back in retaliation. So, Godzilla 1998, what happened? If we're gonna dive into this radioactive quagmire properly, we have to set things up with the proper amount of context and history that King of the Monsters rightly deserves. So let's rewind back to the magically 90s year of 1992. Toho is swinging into high with their second era of Godzilla films, known as the Heisei series, and were wrapping up post-production on Godzilla vs. Mothra, a warmly regarded reboot featuring the benevolent Moth Goddess. Henry Saperstein, who had distributed many of Toho's films for decades, finally convinced the Japanese studio to allow him to pitch an American version of the tokusatsu franchise to Hollywood, as he felt there was a lot of potential for the character to gain appeal across the globe. Things, unfortunately, started out rougher than anger is hide, as both Columbia and TriStar Pictures rejected the pitch, before Henry finally landed a deal at Sony Pictures. The then CEO, Peter Goober, was <laughs> Peter Goober. I'm Goofy Goober was enthusiastic at the idea, and ironically enough, assigned Sony owned TriStar Pictures to produce it. A quick jaunt back to Japan to seal the deal with Toho then resulted in TriStar officially announcing their plans for an American take on Godzilla in October of that year. Jen DeBont was hired to helm the feature, his first as a director as he was previously the DP on such films as Cujo, Die Hard, and The Hunt for Red October. The initial script, which focused on such wild ideas as Goji's origin revolving around Atlantis and an antagonistic monster named the Griffin, was penned by one Terry Rossio and Ted Elliott, a writing duo who had worked on Disney's Aladdin and would go on to the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. It was an ambitious but fantastical take on the source material, with Jan DeBon asking for a reported $100 to $120 million to film it. Stan Winston Studios responsible for such practical effects and suits for films like The Predator, Terminator, and Aliens already began building maquettes for this new Godzilla, which was unfortunately all for naught. Budgetary disputes raged between Jan DeBont and TriStar, which eventually led to the whole thing collapsing. Unable to come to terms, DeBont exited the project and would go on to make his directorial debut with speed. Anything else that'll keep this elevator from falling? Uh, basement. Godzilla languished in development hell for almost two years until the producing slash directing duo of Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich started getting noticed within Hollywood. Their credits included films such as Universal Soldier and Stargate, and at that time were still finishing up their third film, Independence Day. TriStar approached them about picking up their flailing Godzilla baby even before ID4 hit the theaters. They initially passed, with Devlin explaining, both of us thought it was a dopey idea the first time we talked. Then when TriStar came back with a second offer, we still thought it was a dopey idea. So why did the duo eventually get the gig? Well, since TriStar was desperate to finally get the project off the ground, both filmmakers realized they could basically ask for anything, including complete creative control in all aspects of writing and production. If you needed to point at one singular decision that could be construed as the linchpin of disaster, yeah, this would be it. 
It's the clue. Their first order of business was to throw out Rocio and Elliot's script with Emmerich stating, It had some cool things in it, but it's something I never would have done. The last half was just two monsters going at it. I simply don't like that. The pair decided to make their own script from scratch and completed the first draft in just five weeks, with the only connective tissue to Toho's franchise being Godzilla was a creature of the atom, having been informed due to nuclear fallout. I didn't want to make a traditional Godzilla. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted to make my own. We then asked ourselves what we would do today with a monster movie and a story like that. We forgot everything about the original Godzilla right there. Now, while the 1994 version of the script certainly had a lot of big changes, it also leaned heavily into the realm of fantasy, and since the Toho films didn't shy away from things like androids, time travel, space battles, pollution, crap monsters, and dancing, it's safe to say that this new script's focus on a more grounded and realistic world was a little risky. To accommodate this new direction, Devlin and Emmerich also threw out Stan Winston's designs and again decided to make their own, with the only mandate being it needs to run incredibly fast. For some reason. Emmerich again explains his baffling non-logic. I saw the creature that they designed. Jan de Bonk created a Godzilla that was very close to the original, but it was not right because today we wouldn't do it like that. Okay. Creature designer Patrick Totopoulos. Dr. Totopoulos, it's Totopoulos. Who at that time had worked on such films as Bram Stoker's Dracula and the Super Mario Brothers movie. I'll let that sit. Was hired to redesign the legendary monster. Suffice to say, he took a very different approach, saying, what they did, which was a mistake in my mind, was rather than going in a new direction, they tried to alter and make the old one better. And when you do that, first of all, I think it's very disrespectful. It's more disrespectful for me to alter something existing than to take a fresh new direction. Is that really how that works? Regardless, even though the deal had been inked between Sony Pictures and Toho, Toho would have final approval on any new Godzilla designs. Devlin, Emmerich, Totopolis, and the Funky Bunch presented sketches and a maquette to Toho chairman Isayo Matsuoka, producer Shogo Tomiyama, and special effects director Koichi Matsuoko. The trio remained silent for several long minutes before asking if they could reconvene the next day. Emmerich would state, they were speechless. They stared at it for several minutes and asked us to come back tomorrow. I thought for sure we didn't have the movie then. Tomiyama recalled, it was just so different. We realized we couldn't even make slight adjustments. That left the major question on whether to approve it or not. Faced with a choice and not wanting to hold up production any longer, Toho signed off on Godzilla's new look the very next day. With the begrudging all clear from Toho, casting began for the film which would go on to become its own huge issue. In the mid-90s, the summer blockbuster was becoming the big bankable bet for movie studios, which usually had big names attached to them, either behind the lens or in front of it. You have your Steven Spielbergs, your Jim Carreys, or your Tom Cruises, and the like. Who did Godzilla have? Ferris Bueller and 60% of the characters from The Simpsons. The cast of Godzilla was head-scratching to say the least. Our protag, Matthew Broderick, was hot off the failure of the cable guy. Well, you may be the wrong man for the job, but I think you're cute. Mo and Ken Brockman were cast as a cab driver and a TV news anchor, and Jean Reno, a relatively unknown actor in North America at that time, played a French Secret Service agent trying to cover up his country's role in creating Godzilla. Not to be outdone, other problems would plague the production, most egregious being the incredibly tight schedule as TriStar wanted to hit Memorial Weekend 1998, leaving Devlin and Emmerich exactly one year for production and post-production. 
Jurassic Park had released only a few years prior and CG was still kind of wearing its training wheels, so having less than a year to create a completely computer-generated character was a bit insane. <laughs> Why all the noise made for Memorial Weekend, you ask? Well, it was fast becoming the most desirable date for big blockbusters to debut on, as again, the Lost World Jurassic Park had made over $70 million the year prior. To help with the workload, Patrick Totopoulos' crew made a massive animatronic puppet of Godzilla for certain shots, and even made a suit for a stuntman to wear, but in the end, both techniques were rejected and CGI was used in their stead. While the production was working at a breakneck pace, the marketing machine for Godzilla wasn't far behind. Merchandise, t-shirts, posters, all the expected stuff. The toy line was massive, and it had the various scientists in the film armed with cannons and vehicles. Remember this guy? <laughs> of course you don't, but he got a figure too. Bus ads, Taco Bell tie-ins, you name it, they slapped Godzilla's big goofy gob on it. I think I need a bigger book. All of this, however, pales in comparison to the greatest music video of all time, uh -huh. yeah. where Puff Daddy and Jimmy Page finally came together and angrily played a song in Godzilla's face until everything exploded. All of this was fluff, however, as the movie was furiously being edited up until the 11th hour, leading to that big release date. While it was not known at the time, Roland Emmerich would later state he was against TriStar's decision regarding early test screenings, which are normally conducted months ahead of time in case they need to adjust things via editing or special effects. Godzilla received no screenings of the sort, which boded all sorts of bad. The movie finally hit theaters on May 20th, 1998 amidst a torrent of manufactured hype due to the aforementioned merchandising and marketing machine. Actual, real, palatable hype was a bit subdued as again, there was no real established actors that American audiences unfamiliar with Godzilla could rally around. The look of the big G was also pretty divisive among sci-fi and fantasy fans, with many unfavorable comparisons being drawn to the original Toho monster. Now, North America had seen a gamut of Godzilla media over the years, including the Hanna-Barbera cartoon, early 90s toy lines, video games, comics, and some VHS releases, so even the most casual fan knew what Godzilla kinda looked like and how he did things downtown. Therefore, it was no surprise that Roland Emmerich's version of Godzilla took a critical shellacking from critics. Colonel, your campaign's a disaster. Paper-thin, cartoony characters, cringy dialogue and humor, an over-reliance on CGI, wonky pacing, disappointing fight scenes, a much smaller and weaker version of the title character, the list is pretty extensive. But, you know, uneven plots and boring characters are usually hallmarks of the Godzilla films, but the issue here is that when the monster does show up, things don't get much better. The unstoppable force of nature that could decimate anything with its atomic breath was replaced with a simple-minded animal that spent most of the movie's running time just fleeing from the military. These same sentiments were echoed by various people at Toho. Godzilla's suit actor Kimpachiro Satsuma, who played the monster during the Heisei era, walked out of a screening at a Godzilla convention in 1998, muttering, It's not Godzilla. It doesn't have his spirit. Shusuke Kaneko, who directed the successful 90s trilogy of Gamera films, stated, It is interesting that the US version of Godzilla runs about trying to escape missiles. Americans seem unable to accept a creature that cannot be put down by their arms. Toho would immediately try to discredit Emmerich's film in various ways, with the first and most prominent one being fast-tracking a new Godzilla production that would hit Japanese theaters just one year later, dubbed Godzilla Millennium or Godzilla 2000 in the West. This was an attempt to try and salvage the franchise and show that Toho could bring back the true Godzilla spirit. Just a few years later, in 2001's Godzilla GMK, two government officials could be heard saying, 
あれ結局ゴジラだったんだろうアメリカじゃゴジラと名付けた日本の学者は認めてない Oh the heat And of course, most famously, in Godzilla Final Wars, the 1998 version of the creature officially became Zilla, as that suffix could be attributed to other creatures, marking them as Godzilla bootlegs. <laughs> Up until this point, the unofficial fan name for the oversized iguana was Gino, which isn't a moniker that needs much explanation. Regardless of what you call it, Gino Zilla got its shit easily bopped on by Final Wars Goji in a matter of seconds. So, yeah, suffice to say,、uh, Toho held a grudge. Now, despite all this, the most outrageous fact about Godzilla 1998 is its budget. It's been stated that the film cost, before marketing, between $130 and $150 million, considerably more than the $100 to $120 Jan de Bont requested just a few years earlier. Why TriStar and Sony Pictures agreed to a budget that was even higher than the previous attempt is anyone's guess. The most common thinking being, since Devlin and Emmerich were such an up and coming duo who had helmed several other films, Tristar felt it was a safer bet than spending a lot of money on a first time director like Jan de Bont. Speaking of money, the film would open to around $50 million over its first weekend and would eventually go on to make $300 million worldwide. Although this was considered by industry analysts a failure and simply not enough for Sony to hedge their bets on to start a trilogy of films, which was the original plan. Sony would also need to keep licensing Toho's character each year to keep their deal going, and, you know, funnily enough, they didn't re up it to make more films after this one. However, some of the proposed ideas that Dean Devlin drafted up for sequels made their way into Godzilla the Series, a Saturday morning cartoon following the characters from the film, teaming up with a young Godzilla hatchling that quickly grew to full size to fight a rogues gallery of all original kaiju. This series, despite being stuck with the trappings of the movie, is considered by many to be a better alternative than the subject matter it's based on. Then there was Rob Fried, who helped acquire the rights for Tristar. He was angered how the studio handled the property, fuming furiously. The Sony executive team that took over Godzilla was one of the worst cases of executive incompetence I have observed in my 20 year career. One of the golden assets of our time, which was hand delivered to them, was managed as poorly and as ineptly as anybody can manage an asset. They took a jewel and turned it into dust. Emmerich and Devlin, well, they would never really recover from the debacle and languished for years with similarly panned disaster films like 10,000 BC, 2012, Geostorm, and etc. This also essentially killed Godzilla's westward push for more than a decade until Legendary Pictures released their own version in 2014. Toho was originally wary of licensing the character again, but since their Millennium series of Goji films failed at the Japanese box office, they felt it was worth another shot. Legendary's Godzilla would go on to a $500 million haul worldwide, re establish the character once again, and kicked off the understated but nonetheless successful Monsterverse, which will culminate in King Kong vs. Godzilla in 2020. Toho was pleased with Legendary's efforts, stating that they felt the character was finally done justice, which spurred them into hatching plans for their own connected series of kaiju films. Shin Godzilla, their latest live action reboot, did fantastically well for them, but as of right now, Toho has no plans to make a sequel for. And the less said about the anime trilogy, the better. When you look back at everything, though, it really is a testament to the longevity of the monster Toho created, where a disastrous, critically reviled motion picture was not enough to kill the franchise. Any lesser character who had stumbled so hard out of the gate would have been delegated to the dustbin of history right there. But thankfully for us, our giant radioactive overlord will be terrorizing theaters for decades to come. If you know of any other bombastic movie bombs you'd like to see on What Happened, let me know in the comments below or check out the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially vote on upcoming subjects. See you next time and thanks for watching!